Okay, so we're actually going to use a PowerPoint on this slide to try to speed this um, this video up a little bit and because you guys have also been writing these essays, so you should be pretty familiar with most of this material by now. So we're going to be talking about Origin of Life, Beginning of the Earth. So the uh, most of y'all have heard of the Big Bang Theory, okay, which is the original uh, theory about the creation of the universe. Well, it's the most widely accepted theory of the creation of the universe. Um, it, this theory estimates that the uh, universe is about 13 to 15 billion years old, okay, and that all of the existing energy appeared and exploded outward from a single point. So you can see on your diagram over here, you have your single point here where all of the energy appeared and has exploded outward. And eventually um, those particles would form and those particles would uh, coalesce and they would form stars and dust clouds and then meteors and then planets. Right, but that's the, the basis there behind the Big Bang Theory. Okay, so please, please, please do not be writing everything down word for word. Okay, um, summarize things. Make sure you get it into your own words. Do not just blindly copy. Okay, um, one of the things you need to be aware of is after this initial expansion, um, the universe then did cool enough okay, to allow the energy to be converted into the particles, okay, including um, what it were talking about our protons, our neutrons, and our electrons. And initially, the protons and the neutrons combined. Okay? And there was no, um, there were no electrically neutral atoms for a few thousands year of years. It took a while for the electrons to combine with those protons and neutrons to form electrically neutral atoms, to form what we think of now. And as all this was happening, our very first elements that were produced uh, were hydrogen, and a little bit of helium with a little bit of lithium. Giant clouds of these elements um, would come together through gravity and they would form stars and galaxies. So you'd have these giant clouds of hydrogen, a little bit of helium, a little bit of lithium that are forming the basis here of these stars and galaxies. And then the heavier elements would be synthesized within the stars or during a supernova. Okay, so the heavier elements came along later after these stars were formed and these particles had a chance to basically come together to form these heavier elements. So the sun formed about 5 billion years ago. Okay, um, there were lots of dust clouds and asteroids and as these asteroids were colliding together, um, eventually they would start to form planets as they were colliding into one another. The Earth is estimated to be about 4.6 billion years old. Okay? And even after Earth was, was formed, it was still constantly being hit by these meteorites. And the original atmosphere around the Earth consisted of water vapor, carbon dioxide, gaseous hydrogen, and nitrogen. There was no oxygen gas in the original atmosphere that formed around the Earth. The oldest rocks that have been found, they contain iron and they show no oxidation or rusting. Okay, oxidation or rusting can't occur, uh, rusting of iron cannot occur without its exposure to oxygen. So there was no oxygen. Um, what this shows us is that these early iron containing rocks were not exposed to oxygen. And if we think about the order of things as they appeared on Earth, Oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis. So if you don't have any living organisms right now that are doing photosynthesis, you won't have any oxygen production. So the initial atmosphere didn't have any oxygen in it because there were no organisms on Earth that were um, doing photosynthesis. We hadn't even formed amino acids yet. We can use radioactive isotopes to help us date these rocks and fossils so we can get a better idea of when things occurred. So a radioactive isotope is one that decays in a predictable pattern. So we know that it will take a certain amount of time for this radioactive isotope to decay. And we base this on what's called its half-life, which is the amount of time it's going to take for one half of that particular material 
to undergo decay and become a new substance. And one of the most common ones we use is carbon-14. Carbon-14 will decay after about 5,000, after 5,700 years, carbon-14 will decay into uh, nitrogen. All living organisms have the same ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. To carbon and carbon-14 is, radi is a radioactive isotope. It will decay. Carbon-12 will not decay. All living organisms have this exact same ratio of the two. So when an organism dies, it is no longer incorporating carbon into it. And so that carbon-14 will start to decay or break down. And since all living organisms have the exact same ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, and we know what that ratio is, it enables us to determine when the carbon-14 started to decay. And we can measure how long it has decayed for to determine the age of it. Um, carbon-14 is only good for fossils up to about 60,000 years old. Okay? And anything older than that, you have to use a radioactive isotope that has a higher, a longer half-life, and uh, potassium-40, which is a half-life of 1.3 billion years, as well as uranium-38, which is a half-life of 4.5 billion years, are ones that we can use instead. So what we have here are the steps that were needed um, basically to have to have life be able to occur, to go from a non-life planet to a life planet. This is sometimes called the protobiont hypothesis. And a protobiont, um, this hypothesis is the most commonly accepted hypothesis for origin of the life on Earth, just like the Big Bang Theory for the creation of the universe. The, a protobiont is an aggregate or a group of abiotically produced organic molecules surrounded by a membrane. So this um, membrane or membrane-like structure that surrounds these um, abiotically produced organic molecules all of that's going to make up the protobiont. And so it will exhibit some properties that are associated with life. It may be able to do uh, simple reproduction, metabolism, excitability, you know, its ability to respond. It's definitely not going to fit there. Um, as well as being able to maintain homeostasis, that internal environment separate from its external environment. And so it has been thought that this was a key process, that this had to have happened for life on Earth to happen. And we've got a number of experiments that kind of walk through these different steps for the origin of life in this um, protobiont hypothesis, this thought that there's an abiotically produced uh, group of organic compounds surrounded by a membrane. They have a little bit of um, characteristics of life. So these experiments that we're going to go through, you guys do need to be familiar with them, and you need to be familiar with their importance and what they mean. Okay? Again, you've probably been writing about them in your essays, or hopefully you've been writing about them. Okay, so, we're, um, so if we're starting at the beginning here, one of the things we need to remember again is that the early atmosphere was anaerobic. So that means there was no oxygen. Okay? Um, keep in mind, oxygen is very, very corrosive. Okay? And on early... In early, sorry about that, formation of the earth, there was a lot of volcanic eruptions. Okay? And so if there was oxygen present at that time, life as we know it would not exist. Oxygen um, basically is too volatile. Okay? It's too corrosive. Water came from steam and ice from meteorites, okay? and that's what provided water to the earth. So the Miller-Urey experiment uh, demonstrated the abiotic uh, synthesis of organic compounds. So this was kind of the experiment that was the first step in that protobiont uh, hypothesis that we needed organic compounds to form. So what they did when they were doing this was that they took water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. They sealed it inside these glass tubes here, and they were connected to a flask through a loop. And that flask had, one flask had liquid water in it, the other one had electrodes in it. And so what they would do is they would mimic basically lightning. 
using those electrodes. And by mimicking lightning, they were able to see what would happen to the elements that were currently present on Earth. So they would heat the liquid up so that it would evaporate. And then they would fire off those electrodes to get sparks to mimic lightning. And then the atmosphere would be cooled again so that the water would condense and trickle back in to the first flask. And so this would be a constant cycle. So here's my ocean, okay, or my sea. I'd have evaporation occur, my water vapor, that would mix in the atmosphere. And those electrodes would act as lightning. Okay, so I've got now I've got the water vapor, the methane, the nitrogen, the hydrogen, all in the atmosphere. And so when some lightning fires off, now that water vapor gets condensed back down, okay, and it will drip into this flask, and we can monitor that to see what elements appear in that flask. Within two weeks, um, they noticed, Miller and Urey noticed, that 10 to 15 percent of the carbon in the system was now in organic compounds. So they were able to make organic compounds. And remember your organic compounds are things like amino acids, sugars, nucleic acids, and lipids. Since this experiment has been run, it um, has been found that the original atmosphere probably did not contain methane. It probably contained carbon dioxide. And so it made for a more neutral atmosphere. And they still got similar results, just different amounts and different proportions of organic compounds. Glycine was the most abundant organic compound, amino acid, that they found. Nucleic acids were not formed yet with just this reaction. Nucleic acids will come later. Again, you don't need to know every single detail of the experiment, but you need to understand the significance of the experiment. The fact that they were able to mimic early Earth's atmosphere and prove that organic compounds could have been formed from early Earth's atmosphere. Another experiment that was done uh, to show the formation of these small organic mon monomers was uh, based on the iron sulfur world theory. And this one suggests that uh, life may have originated down at the hydrothermal vents under the ocean. Okay? Um, iron sulfide is uh, very important for many, many enzymes. It's a cofactor for a lot of enzymes. It's what helps them work. And so iron sulfur can, sulfide can also donate electrons to dissolve carbon dioxide. And if y'all remember when we talked about ecology, we talked about uh, with the primary productivity and talking about the ecosystems and the fact that water contains dissolved gases. And so iron sulfide can donate electrons to dissolve carbon dioxide to form a bigger organic compound. And this is thought that this may have been kind of the beginning of metabolism, of doing these metabolic reactions. So this uh, hypothesis is based on the fact that the mineral-rich water is going to be heated by the geothermal energy. So the heat energy that's um, surrounding this uh, vent is going to heat the water, and the hydrothermal vents are using carbon monoxide and potassium cyanide to produce amino acids. So they have a carbon source, a nitrogen source. Um, the thought process behind this is that there was a lot of methane, there was a lot of ammonia available in these regions, and these were things that were not necessarily in the atmosphere. We just said that the atmosphere they found later actually contained carbon dioxide, not methane. The problem against this, one of the major issues with this hypothesis, is that um, at very high temperatures, organic compounds are not very stable. And so if they are in the highest temperature zones of these hydrothermal vents, then it may, they may not make it. Um, but that is counteracted by the thought process of that there are numerous bacteria out there that are considered extremophiles that could withstand heat. And so it does still keep it in the running as a possible scenario. There is also evidence that organic molecules could have um, formed in those uh, interstellar clouds and been transported to Earth on meteorites. Meteorites that hit the Earth today often contain amino acids, carbohydrates, those nucleotide bases, um, so that would lend uh, support to this as well. The formation of polymers is still a little iffy on how those were formed. There's a lot of, um, lot of debate as to how the polymers first formed. 
Um, some of the things that they've done to show that they could have formed was is that if you take a solution that contains amino acids,